but uh, a pleasure to welcome you again. Parsha Yitro, great Parsha. So we're going to get started with the uh, Haftor of the week. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, good evening to all. Uh, so, um, I, I guess that if um, if we had to single out one item, uh, one element in this week's Sidra and try to uh, hitch it up as it were to uh, a Haftara, I guess that the hands down choice would be the Aseret HaDibrot. Um, last week in the Sidra Bishalach, uh, surely the hands-down favorite was uh, Kriyat Yam Sof. Uh, and we saw that indeed uh, that was uh, not duplicated as it were in the Haftarah, but replicated in the sense that it also featured a, uh, a song, a poem uh, that commemorated a military victory. Um, the problem in finding a Haftarah that corresponds to the Aseret HaDibrot is the fact that Matan Torah is scarcely mentioned outside of this week's Sidra. In fact, uh, other than the duplication of the Aseret HaDibrot in Sefer Dvarim in the Sidra Va'et Hanan, there are no other uh, explicit references to it in the entire Torah. Uh, and there are only maybe two or three reasonably certain references to it throughout the balance of Nevi'im and Ketuvim. Uh, indeed, as I believe I already hinted uh, uh, last week, the question of why Matan Torah does not occupy as prominent a place in Nevi'im and Ketuvim as Yitziat Mitzrayim occupies uh, really begs the question. If you'll remember, uh, when uh, God and Moshe first meet, as it were, at the Sne, God says to Moshe um, that this will be the sign that, uh, that Yitziat Mitzrayim is divinely inspired, this will be the sign, that is, that when you leave Egypt, ta'avdun et ha'elohim al ha'har hazeh that in fact the conclusive proof that Moses was a divine messenger and that the exodus from Egypt that he engineered was divinely ordained would be the fact that the people would worship God on that mountain, on Mount Sinai. So one could actually argue that certainly from a spiritual or theological perspective, the uh, the worship of God on Har Sinai, or in other words, the revelation of the law, Matan Torah, was really the, the essence of Yitziat Mitzrayim, and that the release from physical oppression and bondage really pales in comparison to the uh, spiritual freedom. And yet, the release from physical bondage, Yitziat Mitzrayim, is commemorated throughout Nevi'im and Ketuvim, just have to refer you to some of the Psalms. Betzeit Yisrael mi Mitzrayim, Beit Yaakov me'am lo'ez. There is no comparable Psalm celebrating Matan Torah. Actually, if you stop to think about it, the absence of uh, subsequent references to Matan Torah after the uh, incident in the, uh, the description of the event in the Torah itself is really part and parcel of another rather perplexing uh, question, um, maybe more of an enigma than a question, and that is, how come we don't even know where Mount Sinai is? We're not really certain which of the mountains in the Sinai desert was the Mount Sinai on which the Torah was revealed to the Jewish people. It's almost as though there's a conspiracy. I'm sorry, I know it's a heavily charged word these days. It, it's almost though 
there's a cabal. That, that's good. That, that's good. Cabal rarely gets used these days. Um, th there was a cabal to prevent uh, Mount Sinai from being identified. And part of the success in suppressing the ident identity of Mount Sinai is the fact that no attention is drawn to what happened there. Now, again, another way to pose the same question would be to say, you know, the exodus from Egypt is celebrated in one of the three principal holidays, Pesach. The wandering in the wilderness is commemorated on another one of the three principal holidays, Sukkot. Stop to think about it. Biblically speaking, none of the principal holidays commemorates Matan Torah. Shavuot is merely the holiday, the, 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 the holiday of the first fruits, the Chag Kurim, that is celebrated 50 days after Pesach. It's only a rabbinic tradition that links Shavuot with Matan Torah. So, not surprisingly, this week's Haftarah does not feature Matan Torah. It does, however, try to come as close as possible to it, as close perhaps as Moses himself was to God when the Torah was revealed. Therefore, the Haftarah that was selected for the Sidra of Yitro is from the sixth and seventh and a teeny, teeny bit from the ninth chapter of the book of Yeshayahu. And it begins, as you see here, in the, uh, the very beginning of Perak Vav of the sixth chapter of Yeshayahu, with what, according to nearly all, but not all of the medieval uh, uh, exegetes, is really the record of how Yeshayahu ben Amotz was inducted, as it were, into the uh, prophetic core. That is to say, his, uh, the term that's generally used in Hebrew is his hakdasha, his sanctification. And it begins, as it tells us, bishnat mot ha-melech in the year in which King Uziyahu died. Va'ir'e, and the Navi says, that he saw God seated upon a lofty throne while the hem, as it were, of God's royal garments filled the palace, filled the temple or the palace. So this is something that is reasonably well known in ancient Near Eastern literature, so much so that it is known as part of a genre whose name is throne visions. That is to say that in the Bible and outside of the Bible, it's well known that people describe the majesty of their kings, mortal and immortal, with what are called throne visions. So here Yeshayahu is relating to us the vision that he obtained of God seated on his throne. And God was attended by srafim. Srafim, the word lisrof, to burn, um, generally is understood to mean fiery angels. Srafim o alo. And these srafim, sheish knafayim, sheish knafayim le'echad. Each had six wings. Bishtayim yechasef anav, with one pair of wings, each seraph covered his face, and with another pair of wings, his legs, and with the remaining pair of wings, Ye'ofeif. Ye'ofeif, of a bird, la'uf, to fly. Maybe they flew, maybe they just hovered. Vikaraze el zeva amar. And one of them 
called to another, saying, Kadosh, 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 Hashem Tzvaot, Melochol Haaretz Kivoda. That God seated on the throne, God, the Lord of the hosts, the heavenly hosts, the mortal hosts, is holy, is holy, is holy. Why do you need to say holy three times? Perhaps because of the concluding phrase, Melochol Haaretz Kivodo, that since his glory is so great that it suffuses the entire world, not just the earth, but arguably the entire universe, then to simply proclaim God to be holy is an understatement. Therefore, perhaps the uh, threefold repetition of Kadosh is a form of obeisance to God, a form of acknowledgement that his holiness exceeds other holiness. Things are holy. You know, holiness is not something of which we are incapable. You may recall, and if you don't recall, pay careful attention, Shabbat, as the Sidra of Yitro is read once again, that prior to Matan Torah, God says that one of the purposes for which the law is being revealed to the Jewish people is in order to transform them into a mamlechet kohanim, a kingdom of priests or servants to God, the goy kadosh, and a holy nation. So God indeed proclaims that holiness is something of which we are capable. And we're not only capable of it as a national exercise, we're capable of it as a communal exercise, which is why the official Hebrew name of most Jewish communities, and indeed even of many synagogues to this very day, is Kihila Kedosha, the Holy Congregation. And Kedusha is not only something that we are capable of on a national level and our communal level, we're capable of it on an individual level as well. As a matter of fact, according to Torah law and its elaboration in rabbinic law, anything, any object of value, I can take it and I can pro proclaim that it is holy. Once I proclaim it to be holy, it then belongs as it were to God, or at least it belongs to the temple where it is either put to use if it is appropriate in the service of God, or it is transformed into a monetary value and the money is put to the service of God. So perhaps that since Kedusha is something of which we are able to attain on a personal level, to say that God is Kadosh is understated. Therefore, the triplication of Kadosh, 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 as simply a meager way of acknowledging that the Kedusha of God is far beyond anything of which we are capable individually, communally, or for that matter, even nationally. And then Pasuk Dalet concludes this segment of the Haftarah by saying that uh, as he was observing God seated upon his throne and being ministered to by these seraphim, vayanu'u amot hasipim mikol hakore, that the building, as it were, that housed the throne room, began to shake on account of the sound of the seraphim calling kadosh to one another, Vahabayit and the, uh, the edifice, the house, Yimale Ashan was filled with smoke. Maybe the smoke of the incense, the Ashan of the Ketoret. Okay. The question of when Yeshayahu began his prophecy 
is of historical significance. Yeshayahu introduces his own book by declaring that his visions occurred during the reigns of kings Uziyahu, Yotam, Ahaz, and Chizkiyahu. Now that's four kings, four consecutive reigns, which add up altogether to more than an ordinary lifespan. Therefore, doesn't say that Yeshayahu became a prophet on the first day of Uziyahu's reign, and he continued to prophesy until the last day of Chizkiyahu's reign. It's possible that his prophecy began only at some point into the reign of Uziyahu and concluded at some subsequent point into the reign of Chizkiyahu. And that would narrow down the window of prophetic opportunity, so to speak, to a much more manageable number. But there's something else about King Uziyahu that makes this somewhat complicated. Uziyahu is credited in Tanakh with an exceptionally long reign. In fact, the only reign of a king of Judah longer than Uziyahu was his great-great-great-grandson Menashe, who reigned for 55 years, even though he was described by the Tanakh as being essentially evil. Uziyahu is credited with an extensive reign but we have good reason to believe that his son Yotam and his grandson Ahaz occupied the throne in, his own, in Uziyahu's own lifetime. Now, the only way that a king could cede the throne, as it were, to a son or to a grandson is if something happened to disqualify him from reigning. And indeed, the tradition has it that King Uziyahu was disqualified from reigning over the kingdom of Judah, and he became a leper, a mitzorah. As you see the second of the two sources here, there's a midrash, and it appears in the Gemara as well in a slightly different formulation that says, Arba'ahem chashuvim metim. There are four people who, while they are still alive, are considered as though they were dead. Suma, a blind person. Mitzora, a leper. Mishearad minachasav, somebody who's gone bankrupt. Umishen lo banim, and someone who's childless. So on the argument that a leper is considered as though he were dead, the, uh, the argument is that Uziyahu, when he became a leper, had to step down from his throne, allowing his son Ahaz, uh, son Yotam and his grandson Ahaz to rule even in his own lifetime. And that Yeshayahu became a Navi at this point in time, at the point at which Uziyahu became a Mitzorah. So technically it was in, still in the reign of Uziyahu, and yet it was the very end of the reign of Uziyahu, and it continued on through the reigns of Yotam and Ahaz and into the reign of Chizkiyahu. Now, what is Yeshayahu's reaction to this vision, this magnificent vision of God seated, as it were, in his palace on a throne, surrounded by his ministering angels. Va'omar, says Yeshayahu, oi li. See, See he was Jewish, he said oi, right? Oi li, ki nidmeti, right? He said, I I've been undone. Why? Ki ish svatayim anochi, because I am a person whose lips are unclean. And moreover, and I dwell 
amongst the people, a nation of, uh, of unclean lips. And therefore, I'm simply not worthy of this vision. How can somebody as, as insignificant as I witness this magnificent vision? Whereupon one of these fiery angels approaches Yeshayahu, Uviado Ritzpa holding a, a, an ember or a glowing coal, the Melkachayim in a tongues, Lakach Me'alam is Beach. Said just a moment before that it's possible that the Asham, the smoke that was filling the throne room, was the smoke that came from the incense, the ketoret, that was kindled on the Mizbeach in the Beit HaMikdash. And here indeed we see that the, ser the seraph approaches Yeshayahu with a glowing coal that was taken from upon the Mizbeach. Now, Vayaga Alpi, and with the glowing coal, the seraph touches Yeshayahu's mouth, right? The mouth that he had said just a moment ago was unclean. Therefore, arguably, the purpose for which the coal serves is to purify his lips. Vayomer, and indeed the seraph proclaims, Hinei al sfatecha, that with the, the, the touch of this glowing coal to your lips, Sar avonecha, your sins, which you believed made you unclean, have uh, gone away. Vachatatcha techupar, and whatever sins you may have had or have been atoned. So essentially what we find is that in this vision, Yeshayahu apparently starts off as a civilian, right? He's a perfectly ordinary person, He's no better and no different from anybody else. Everybody's a Tmei Svatayim. Yeshayahu is a Tmei Svatayim. But when he emerges from this vision, he's been elevated. He's been elevated to a status, to a degree above that of ordinary people, right? And arguably, as we will see in the continuation, that is what makes him eligible to become a prophet. By the way, just a not entirely random thought. If indeed seraphim, as the name seems to imply, are fiery angels, what does it mean to say that a fi an angel, a fiery angel, had to take a glowing coal from the Mizbeach with a pair of tongues? How hot must this coal have been if a seraph could not hold it in his hand, but needed to a pair of tongues to hold it? And that is what, at least in this vision, touches the prophet's lips. Now, this is an opportunity to pause for a moment and to reflect on what we know about how other prophets were initiated, as it were, how they experienced their own hakdashot, their own sanctification. Let's start with something that we read just a few weeks ago, right? With the hakdasha, the sanctification of Moses at the burning bush. I've highlighted the uh, the uh, uh, pertinent passages. God says to Moshe, you're going to be my messenger to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell Pharaoh, right, in those immortal words, let my people go. What's Moshe's reaction? Does he jump up and down with joy and say, oh, goody, goody, I've been waiting for this all my life. I've been preparing for this moment. No. Moses says, ki chavad peh, I am either ineligible or incapable of this mission, right? 
And when God tries to persuade him by saying, in verse 11, Mi sam pela adam, who do you think gives people the power of speech? It's me, says God. So don't worry about the fact that you don't think that you are a good public speaker. I can wave my magic wand, so to speak, and I can make you a great public speaker. Moshe is not persuaded. He says, Bi Adonai, shlach na biyad tishlach. Please, God, send anybody else but me. Setting the tone here for what will follow, and that is that it seems that it's SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, for people who are called upon by God to serve as prophets and messengers to decline the offer. We find it next in the sixth chapter of the book of Judges in the person of Gideon, Gideon, right? God says to Gideon, Lech b'chochacha zevaho sharata et Yisrael mikaf midyan halosh lachticha. Go and free the Israelites from their Midianite oppressors. You are my messenger. What does Gideon say? Yisrael. How, how can I be the savior of the Jewish people? My clan is the poorest in my tribe. And I am the least in my household. Once again, I am unworthy of this. I am ineligible for this. Perhaps the most detailed and most striking instance of a prophet declining the dubious honor of being God's messenger to a people that has a long history of resisting God's messengers is Yirmiyahu. And you can see that I highlighted a couple of passages in the Yirmiyahu selection. And if your eye already went to the lower passage, the one that's underlined in orange, so you already know what the connection is, but let's wait and get there all together. The book of Yirmiyahu, Perak Aleph, Pasuk Aleph begins by saying, God spoke to me, to Jeremiah, saying, before you were fashioned in your mother's womb, I recognized you. Before you emerged from her womb, I sanctified you, and I made you into a navi, into a messenger or a spokesman for God. Yumiyahu replies by saying, aha! See, he says, oi, one says, oi, one says, aha, okay? Hine lo ya da'ati daber. I don't even know, I, I, I'm not, not only not a polished public speaker, I wouldn't even know what to say as a messenger. I, I, I'm, I'm too young. I, I'm inexperienced. God continues and says, right? That's not going to work with me, says God. Right? It's an excuse that you're too young. You will go wherever I send you. And you indeed will deliver whatever message I dictate to you. I know that you're anxious because you know that people, the people generally do not provide Nevi'im uh, with the most welcome of receptions. But don't fear, God says, because I will be with you, and if you are in danger, I will rescue you. God, as it were, stretched forth his own hand and touched Yirmiyahu on his mouth. Vayomer and said to him, Hinenatati devarai beficha. Right? By touching your lips, as it were, I have placed my, your, my message in your mouth. 
as though all you need to do is open your mouth and the message as it were, will come out all on its own. And he concludes by telling him, by giving him essence, the essence, uh, the synopsis of what he will do as a prophet. That I have appointed you this day on a variety of different nations and kingdoms. Lintosh, the lintots, ulaha avid, the laha ros. A fourfold message of destruction. Lintosh to abandon, lintots to break apart, laha avid to destroy, laha ros to tear apart. But the fourfold message of destruction is also followed by live not. A twofold message of consolation, of rebuilding and of replanting. It's interesting that although our Tanakhim, right, when we open them, we find that immediately following the book of Kings, say from Malachim, is the book of Yeshayahu. And following Yeshayahu is Yirmiyahu, and following Yirmiyahu is Yechezkeel, which in fact is the proper chronological order in which the three of them lived. In the Talmud's Tanakh, Sefer Malachim was followed by Yirmiyahu. Why? Because they, the arrangement was not chronological, the arrangement was thematic. And since the Book of Kings ends on the note of destruction, the rabbis said it was only appropriate for the destruction of the temple that is narrated at the end of the Book of Kings to be followed by the Book of Yirmiyahu which is overwhelmingly a prophecy of doom and destruction. And perhaps they were influenced by this verse in which the doom and destruction outnumber the consolation and the rebuilding two to one. Okay. But as long as we're on the subject of initial prophecies of where people who a moment before were ordinary people, or they may have been extraordinary people, but what made them extraordinary was not because God had spoken to them, okay? I thought that it might be of interest and serve our purpose to look at a slightly different initiation, the one that was experienced by the prophet Samuel. We're told at the beginning of chapter three of the book of Samuel, Hanar Shmuel Misharet et Hashem Lifnei Eli. That Samuel, if you recall, when, uh, when Samuel's mother, Hannah, prayed for a child, she made a promise that the child would be devoted to the Mishkan. And indeed, when Samuel was born, he remained home with his mother, we assume for two years, until he was weaned. And then she brought him to Shiloh and she turned him over to Eli, who was the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, so that Shemuel should serve in the Mishkan. Now we know that Shemuel was a Levi and therefore it's not at all surprising that a Levi ends up serving in the Mishkan. And here we're told that indeed Shmuel as a child, as a Na'ar, or as a young man, remember that Yirmiyahu complained that he was a Na'ar and too young, right? So Na'ar is generally, it's usually translated as a youth rather than as a child, right? Usually Yelet is a child, Na'ar is a youth. The assumption is, is that something that nowadays we call a tween, okay? So Shmuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, the high priest. Udvar Hashem haya yakar bayamim 
The word of God was rare. It was precious in those days. Ein chazon nifratz. Prophecy was not widespread. Once upon a time, vahi bayom ahu, ve'eli shochei bimkomo ve'einav hechelu chehot lo yuchali rot, Eli, who was already very old and whose eyesight was dimming, was asleep, right? right? That, uh, that the, the lamp, right? The, the, um, the uh, ner tamid, so to speak, right? Was still uh, lit, okay? And Samuel, right, as Ailey's, uh, as Ailey's uh, uh, you know, charge, uh, also had his um, uh, residence, his dorm room, so to speak, in the Mishkan complex. Vayikra Hashem el Shmuel, God called out to Samuel, Vayomer and Samuel in response said, Hineni. You may recall Abraham, when he was called upon God, said, Hineni. Moses, when he was called upon by God, said, Hineni. I don't know whether Samuel knew the stories of Abraham and Moses and therefore knew that if he heard a heavenly voice, he had to say, Hineni. Or maybe just, you know, he just came up with it spontaneously. But the fact of the matter is that Samuel didn't know that God was calling him. Samuel thought that it was Eli calling him. And in verse five, Samuel runs to Eli and he says, Eli, you called me. Eli says, Lo karati, I didn't call you. Shuv shechav, go back to sleep. Vayelech, Samuel went back to his room Vayishkap, and he went back to sleep. What does God do? Vayosef Hashem kro'od Shmuel. God once again called out to Samuel. And Samuel once again gets up out of bed and once again goes to Eli, and now he says to Eli again, Hineni, here I am. You called me. And Eli once again says, Lo karati vni shuvshav. I didn't call you my son, go back to sleep. If we're going to be careful readers of the text, um, notice that in verse four, it says, Vayikra Hashem El Shmuel. God called out to Samuel. It doesn't say what God called. In verse six, it says, Vayosef Hashem, that God once again, kara od Shmuel. Doesn't say kara el Shmuel. It says kara Shmuel, suggesting that what God actually said to Samuel was his name, that God called out the name Samuel. Notice also that the first time Eli tells Samuel to go back to bed, he just says, Shuv shchav go back to bed. The second time he says, B'ni shuv shchav, my son, my boy, go back to sleep. There's something building up here. Samuel hasn't figured out yet what's, what's going on, but Eli already has an inkling. And we go on, and we find in the continuation in verse 8, Vayosef Hashem kro Shmuel bashlishit. God now for the third time, calls Samuel. And Samuel now for the third time runs into Eli and says, Hineni, you called me. And now it says, Vayiven Eli, now Eli was certain, he understood. Ki Hashem kore la na'ar. That if Samuel kept on hearing a voice that was calling his name, and it wasn't Eli who was calling his name, then the only reasonable alternative was that it was God who was calling Samuel by name. And he says to Samuel, Lech Shechav, not Shuv Shechav, not go back to sleep. Now he only tells him Shuv Shechav, go back to bed. 
Vaya im yikrai lecha, because Eli now has this strong feeling that it's going to happen again. And he says, now if the voice comes again and summons you, now you should respond by saying, Daber Hashem, speak to me, O Lord, Kishomera Avdecha, because I, your servant, am attentive to you. Vayelech Shmuel, Samuel went, Vayishka Bimkomo, and he went back to bed. And once again, Vayavo Hashem, Vayityatse, God now comes, and as it were, he stations himself alongside Samuel. Vayikra kefa'am b'fa'am. And now we get what we only, only uh, inferred previously, now becomes explicit. And we're told that just as God had done on the previous occasions, he called out Shemuel, Shemuel, called his name twice. To which Shmuel now responded, "Daber kishomea avdecha," just as Eli had instructed him. I think that there is something that's implicit here that we ought to make explicit if we really want to understand not just the initial uh, initiation or, or sanctification. Of, uh, of a Navi, but we want to gain as much insight as we can into just how Nevu'ah operated. We know from the Torah, we haven't gotten to that parasha yet, but we will shortly, that when God wanted to speak to Moses, the Anan, the cloud, would settle on the Ohel Moed, on the Tent of Meeting, and that would be the sign to Moshe that God was there awaiting him. And then Moshe would enter the Ohel, and he would speak with God. And then when Moshe would exit the Ohel because the conversation was over, the cloud would be lifted off the Ohel Moed. So let's say that you figure this out, and you know that every time the cloud descends on Ohel Moed and Moshe goes inside, God is going to talk to him, and you snuck up to the Ohel and planted a microphone so that you could eavesdrop on the conversation between God and Moses. What would you hear? I'm not answering the question, not because I want to withhold the answer from you, but because there is no, uh, there is no definitive answer to that question. Um, part of the fact that there's no definitive answer to that question is a failing of biblical Hebrew. One of the failings of biblical Hebrew is that it failed to anticipate the noun communication. In modern Hebrew, there is a noun, tikshoret, and it means communication, right? What kind of communication? There are a variety of different means of communication. You can communicate verbally, you can <clears throat> communicate visually, right? Kinesthetically, there are different ways in which to communicate. But because biblical Hebrew has no word and no verb for communicate, all it has is vayedaber and vayishma. So all the Torah can tell us is vayedaber Hashem al Moshe lemor, which invariably, correctly, gets translated as God spoke to Moses saying. When you see spoke and saying, there's an automatic assumption that the communication was verbal. And therefore you would assume that your microphone would pick up the sound of God and Moses talking. Problem with that is that one of Maimonides' 13 articles of faith, third one, I believe, maintains that God is incorporeal, ain't no goof, right? 
Velo yasiguhu masigegov. Because God is incorporeal, it is also incorrect to speak of God using corporeal attributes. Therefore, if God has no physical existence, then he cannot speak because speech requires lungs, right? To compress the air, a windpipe through which the air comes out of the lungs, vocal cords through which the air resonates, right? And then a mouth and a tongue and lips through which the vowels and the consonants are formed. Since God has none of those physical attributes, God cannot speak. Therefore, Maimonides in the guide and elsewhere misses no opportunity to remind us that every place in the Bible that it says God spoke should be understood metaphorically. However, if when Moshe emerged from the tent, you had intercepted Moshe, right? And said, Moses, did God just speak to you? What would Moses have said? Well, of course. And if you had pressed on and said, Moses, you, you mean you, you actually heard him speaking to you? Moses would probably have said, yes, I heard him speak. Well, tell me, Moses, what do they sound like? Did, did he sound like he sounds in the Ten Commandments? I mean, what does the voice of God sound like? I think that the story of Samuel gives us somewhat of a maybe superficial insight. And that is, if each and every time that God called out to Samuel, Samuel ran to Ailey, then it seems to suggest that it's because the voice that he heard calling his name was the voice of Eli, which means that God, understanding and appreciating that Samuel was a Na'ar, that he was still young, he was inexperienced, he was shy, diffident maybe, didn't want to frighten him. Remember, call Hashem Bakoach. Call Hashem Shover Razim. Right? God's voice, right? God's voice can cause the earth to tremble. God's voice can call the can cause the cedars of Lebanon to fall down. God will not appear. Pardon expression. Right? God will not appear to a prophet with the voice that is shover razim. God will appear to a prophet in a voice that the prophet will recognize as a voice of authority. Eli to Shmuel was the voice of authority. And therefore God made his initial approach to Shmuel using the voice of Eli, the voice of authority. We go on, and the prophet Yeshayahu continues, and he says that after this episode in which uh, he was cleansed, as it were, of his sins, he heard the voice of God asking, Mi ashlach, whom shall we send? Mi elech lanu, who will represent us? And all of a sudden, Yeshayahu finds his inner strength, and he says, Hineni. That's in the fine prophetic tradition, Abraham, Moses, Samuel, right? Hineni, I am here. Shlacheni, I am ready to be sent. That ends chapter six of Yeshayahu. Chapter seven, whose first six verses are the continuation of the Haftarah, consist of a prophecy that has historical fulfillment. 
We move now from the reign of Uziyahu to the reign of Ahaz, his grandson. Ahaz, the son of Yotam, grandson of Uziyahu. Ahaz reigned for 16 years. So there is at least a 16 year gap between Perek Vav and Perek Zion, at least according to the chronology as we presented it. So we've taken quite a leap and Yeshayahu in the intervening 16 years has matured, right? He's no longer a Na'ar. He's already experienced the reaction on the resistance that the people will show to a message that is a message of rebuke and of impending doom and destruction. And now he is told, right, um, that uh, to prophesy to King Ahaz about a forthcoming battle that will be fought against the combined forces of Aram and the Northern Kingdom of Samaria, okay? God says to Yeshayahu, say na likrat achaz, go out to meet the king, very reminiscent of God's instructions to Moses to go out and to meet Pharaoh. Ata you, usha'ar yashuv benecha, and your son, sha'ar yashuv. Names of the children are of great significance throughout the book of Yeshayahu, and not only Yeshayahu, other Nevi'im as well, are told to give their children uh, very symbolic names. The question of whether the child's birth certificate read Sha'ar Yashuv, or whether that was just simply the name that his father used to call him when he made his prophetic presentations, is an open question. Okay. And they should go out to Kitsei Ta'ala Ta'brecha Ha'el Yona. They should go out to the uh, pool in the upper city of Jerusalem, El Misilatz de Coves, the pool in which apparently people used to wash things, maybe do laundry, maybe cleanse wool, whatever it was. Ve'amar Ta'ilav, it is instructed to say to the king as follows, Hishamer, beware, Hashkeit, be tranquil, Al tira, don't fear. Levavcha al yerach, don't allow your heart to be weakened. Mishnei zanvot ha'udim ha'ashenim ha'ele, of these two smoking uh, uh, brand, fire brands, the, the king of Aram and the king of Yisrael. Okay, ya'an ki ya'atzalecha Aram ra'a, even though the Arameans' intentions towards the kingdom of Judah are evil intentions, saying, let us go up against Judah and take it apart. We will breach its walls. And we will replace the true king of Judah with a puppet of our own on its throne. And then, as though it were too much for us to bear reading about the battle, the Haftarah inexplicably skips the balance of chapter seven, all of chapter eight, and jumps to a conclusion of two psukim in chapter nine, which prophesy the distant future arrival of a figure whom we call the Mashiach. Ki yeled yulad lanu, a child is born unto us. Bein nitan lanu, a son is given to us. Vatihiyam misra al shichmo, and the service or the government will be, or the burden of government will be placed upon his shoulders. Vayikra shemo, and his name was Pele Yoetz, marvelous counselor, El Gibor, mighty lord, Avi Ad, eternal father, Sar Shalom, prince of peace. If you recognize any of those, and particularly the prince of peace, as something that you often see emblazoned 
on the walls of churches, it's because the Christian church decided that the child referred to here is Jesus. Although a careful reading does not say that the child will be born, that the son will be given, and that his name will be called. It says a child was born, a son was given, and his name was called. Seemingly again implying that it is not, it is not a reference to a future birth, but that it is using an existing birth, a past birth, an existing child as a symbol. A symbol, yes, of salvation, a symbol of, 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 uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, redemption, of deliverance, but a symbol only. All of these things, as we know, are things that came to pass partially in the kingdom of Judah, but that all together are only for the distant eschatological future. I want to say one thing just in conclusion about the holy, holy, holy. As long as I made reference at the end to uh, interpretation that Christians gave to the ninth chapter of Yeshayahu, very similar to the one that they gave of the 11th chapter, right? The one that talks about the, uh, the young woman giving birth to a child, which they misconstrued as a virgin, should point out that, of course, holy, 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 kadosh, 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 is also the subject of Christian interpretation, since they maintain that it is repeated three times in, in order to represent the Trinity. And Radak and Malbim and other, and Ibn Ezra, and other commentators argue, as I indeed already suggested when we came across those three words initially, that it's here simply as a form of hyperbole, as a form of exaggeration, as a form of indicating that the holiness that we attach to God is considerably in excess of any measure of holiness that we can expect or hope to achieve on our own. Nonetheless, I just want to point out that you can see this very clearly in the fourth chapter of the New Testament book of Revelations. Revelations is the last of the books of the New Testament. And in chapter four in particular, as you can see, there are any of a number of not merely allusions, but literally citations from the sixth chapter of Yeshayahu. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. That's right. Okay. There are some allusions to Ezekiel as well, but then we come back. Each of the four beasts had six wings about him. That's the Sheish Knafayim. And they, they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Kadosh, 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 Hashem, Tzvaot, etc. And when those beasts give glory and honor, Meloch, Olaretz, Kvodo, etc., etc. And I couldn't resist because we had the opportunity several years ago to visit the city of Prague. And if you take a tour, any tour that you take of the old city of Prague is going to take you across what's called the Charles Bridge. And on the Charles Bridge, folks, there's a statue. And it's clearly a statue of Jesus being crucified. And yet, as you see on the top, it says Kadosh. And all along the cross, it says Kadosh, Kadosh, Hashem, Tzvaot. Apparently, somebody couldn't take it and remove the Vav and part of the He, so at least you don't get the full tetragrammaton. I don't know if this was an accident or if this was, uh, uh, if this was, uh, uh, you know, sabotage. I, I, I don't know. Um, but nevertheless, 
uh, and of course, um, the letters I, N, R, I. You'll excuse my uh, Brooklyn uh, accented Latin, uh, but I is Jesus, uh, N is Nazarene, R is Regum, and I is, is, is Yuda. I, N, R, I is simply saying Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth King of the Jews. The statue itself dates from the close of the 17th century. It's been there, Kanai Nahara, right, for 300 plus years. And there you go. Okay. Thank you. All right. And a few questions. Okay. Let me take a quick look here at the at the chat. Uh, yeah. yeah, I bet Samuel not having known God calling Abraham Moshe. I certainly knew who Abraham and Moses were, but whether he knew that whether he knew that the Torah text, you know, precisely, and he knew that he was expected of him, that, that was my, my speculation. Okay. Yeah, how did they pro communicate? They said that the, the communication didn't have to be verbal communication. Uh, we're certainly all well acquainted with the concept of telepathy. Uh, certainly would not be beyond the, beyond the ability of God to communicate with a prophet telepathically. So that the prophet would believe that he heard a voice. But if you had come to him and said to him, but here, I recorded it on my tape recorder and I push playback, there's no sound. The prophet may have been as surprised as you were. Okay, um, why is chapter seven included? You may remember going back to the very, very beginning. We said that ideally a haftarah will match the sidra in the number of verses. Since seven people are called to the Torah on an ordinary Shabbat, and each one has to be read a minimum of three verses, therefore, if you multiply seven times three, you get 21. Therefore, ideally, we found that it's not always the case, but ideally, a haftarah should consist of 21 verses. Chapter 6 of Yeshayahu has only 13 verses. So they added six verses from the beginning of chapter 7. They didn't want to continue in chapter 7 because it goes off into the historical episode and it's a bit too much. Therefore, they then had 19 verses, so they needed two more verses. So they went to the next nearest point of consolation, in the beginning of chapter nine and threw that in as well. Okay. At some point it says God spoke to the Jewish people. How did all the people hear God? That indeed is the miracle of Matan Torah. The Jewish people heard God, but they only heard him reading the first two of the so-called 10 commandments. In fact, it was such a frightening experience to them that they ran to Moses and they said, Dabere atayimanu v'nishma'a, you be the one to transmit to us the words of God. And let God no, no longer speak to us directly, pen namut, because we're afraid that we will die as a result. So that indeed, did I make reference last week to the Sheish Zichirot? I know you I did at I some did. point. I believe I, I did. Again, if you open if you open your Sidur past Shacharit and you find the so-called Sheish Zichirot, of which I think somehow Lubavitch have only four. Um, if you go to the Sheish Zichirot, right, the six psukim in the Torah that that contain the word Zachor as an imperative, something that we are that we are instructed to remember, one of them will be to remember the day of Matan Torah of which the Torah itself says in Sefer Devarim, not in this week's Sidra, Hashama am kol Elohim midaber mitoch ha'esh kamono vayechi. That this is the only recorded instance in history of people actually hearing the voice of God and living to talk about it. So indeed, that's what it is. And there we go. Somebody just wanted to know which two do they leave out? 
Uh, the Arizal left uh, had only four Zechirot and not six. I, I'm not sure which they were, and I'm not sure which. Uh, I'm not sure that the Lubavitch follow the Nusach Ari. They usually do, and that's why I'm I'm taking a, a gamble here that somehow if the Ari had only four, they have only four. But I, I don't really know which they are. Okay, uh, Eric, did you have your hand up to ask a question? You're muted, I believe. Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, why you use the term uh, New Testament uh, instead of the term Christian scripture. <laughs> Dr. Lakshan had to deal with this question a few weeks ago also. So let, let's hear the answer. That's what they call it. Right. I mean, uh, I, I'd, like to call, I'd like to call Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet West Side Story. But, you know, I can't. They keep called it Romeo and Juliet. I, I, I mean, I, nothing, nothing. Uh, I have not thought about it nearly enough uh, intensively or extensively for you to read anything into it other than the fact that that's what the book is called. I have so one it, on my shelf, and that's what it says on the title page. It, it, it's very interesting your response. Dr. Lakshin, who's giving a class now on Parshanut and polemics, also referred to the New Testament, and somebody was not happy about it. So he just explained that uh, there's no better name for it. He says he doesn't like um, it's the Gospels only refer to part. Of, I'm not expert enough, but the Gospels only refer to some of the books. So that's incorrect. He doesn't like the, uh, you know, the, the Christian Bible, whatever he thinks the best name is New Testament. I don't think any Jew saying the New Testament means to say that it's, uh, you know, it replaces the Old Testament. That's not our belief. So it, it's just interesting, you know, but um, yeah, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. That's what they call it. That, that's not what we mean, even if that's, you know, what they may mean. Debbie, I think you also have your hand up for, I think, a quick question. Yeah, um, I had written in the chat that um, sometimes, it, like, for example, at Parsha uh, Vayera, Hashem comes to Abraham, there's nothing said. I think sometimes you just, I, I imagine that he just senses that Hashem is there, that there's a communication that way. You just, otherwise, what else would it mean? Yeah, um, it, it, I, the, the, the late, I think the most recent book by James Kugel is all about this subject. Um, I, I wish no, because you had said that you can communicate without words. That's what I was oh, yeah, yeah. with. To get a, 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 a sensation of a, of, a, of a heavenly presence? <laughs> sure, why not? But I, I'm pretty sure if anybody wants to just, you know, Google it, I'm pretty sure that the, the, that's the, the subject of James. He may have written a newer book that I'm not aware of yet. He, he, he's, he's very, you know, prolific. Prolific. But the, 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 the last book that I'm aware of just a couple of years ago was actually on, on the subject of, 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 of revelations, of prophetic revelations. Okay, we want to thank you. We look forward to next week. Somebody pointing out, Ilana pointing out that the Babich does say all six of the Srirot. Okay, they don't follow the okay. Sri. Then, then, then it's, 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 still, it's still the Ari. Okay, okay, so the Ari, right, they're not following there. Okay, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, I